every person on this planet that has made money has mastered these four simple steps. We easily saving have about 70 people in our class a cost week. Cost control. We teach the men personal finance, about stock investments, diversification, and retirement, and how to manage their money. That's it. You got a lot of older guys at San Quentin. I myself pushing 50. You know, a guy getting out who hasn't invested anything into his retirement at all. What is this guy going to do? Half the prison guards don't know who's managing their retirement fund. It's just somewhere in La La Land and it's being taken care of. The first time we came to San Quentin, the prison was covered in fog. We parked and the woman next to us looked over, rolled her eyes and said, fog line, good luck getting in. San Quentin, just north of Golden Gate Bridge, is right on the fog path that famously shrouds San Francisco. Perfect conditions for an escape, the passing of contraband, the procurement of a weapon. Prisoners are kept in their cells, visitors kept out. It's the Bay Area where fog and eccentrics and do-gooders pour into every nook and cranny. All right. Thank you all for tuning in to WJT 98.3 FM, your voice and music, your station. My name is Chef Badu, and I'm a parallel entrepreneur and a wealth multiplier. I'm the founder and CEO of Badu Enterprises, LLC, which is a multinational conglomerate in the finance industry. So today we're here to talk about a very important topic of um, basically building up your credit score. And for those that are tuning in for the first time, this is the show Money Talks, where all we talk is money. We're live on WGHC um, 98.3 FM. And ultimately, what we do on this segment is we talk all types of money um, conversations. So we bring up different topics once a week. And today, the topic that I would like to bring to the table is about building up your credit score even during the pandemic. So what are some, some things you can do right now to build your credit? Um, perhaps you are going through some financial, um, you know, financial challenges, so your credit may be down, or you're brand new at the credit game and you're looking to start fresh, or you're basically you're just looking to gain some insight as it relates to building your credit score. So that's what we'll be discussing today. And once again, we are live on WJC LP 98.3 FM. And if you do want to make a donation, um, you can very well do so on our website. Um, excuse me. I'll, I'll, what I'll do actually on the, on the Facebook Live, on the Instagram, I'll post the link to the website just so you guys have it in case you do want to make a donation especially as we are at the end of the year. There are some tax deductible um, donations that you can make towards the station. Before that, we all report as of December 4th, 2020. November closed on a sour note as investors took profits from stocks last Monday. So basically, they sold the stocks. The Russell 2000, which gained more than 18% in November, fell nearly 2% on the day, the global Dow dropped 1.7%, followed by the Dow um, at negative 0.9%, and then the S&P 500 at negative 0.5%, and the NASDAQ at negative 0.1%. Treasuries and the dollar advanced while crude oil prices fell. Healthcare and information technology, or IT for short, were the only market sectors to post gains. Energy, financials, industrials, and utilities each dropped at least 1%. So overall, the market was pretty down last Monday. It was, um, it, it was basically not, not so good day because investors wanted to sell their stocks, basically. Stocks rebounded last Tuesday to start December off with a bang. Renewed hope for a stimulus deal and the growing potential of a COVID-19 virus vaccine added to investors' confidence. The S&P 500 and the NASDAQ reached record highs by the close of trading. Communication services, financials, real estate, and information technology led the sectors. The dollar slid to its lowest level 
since um, in more than two years. So that's pretty important. The dollar slipped to its lowest level in more than two years, probably due to the fact that they're printing money like crazy. And also the fact that that the U.S. is in about three trillion dollars of debt, basically. Um, but crude oil prices fell and Treasury yields advanced. Among the benchmark indexes, the global Dow added 1.4 percent, followed by the Nasdaq, which is composed mainly of technology stocks. That went up 1.3 percent Then the S&P 500, 1.1 percent. Russia 2,000, 0.9%, and the Dow at 0.6%. Now, a few things to note is that the... So let, let's go to what happened last Wednesday. So last Wednesday, the S&P 500 hit another record as stocks closed generally higher for the second consecutive day. The global Dow continued to surge, climbing 1.5%, Followed by the Dow at 0.2 percent, the S&P 500 at 0.2 percent, and then the Russell 2000 at 0.1 percent. Only the Nasdaq ended the day slightly in the red, falling a mere 0.1 percent. Treasury yields and crude oil prices rose while the dollar sank. Energy led the sectors advancing over 3 percent. Then financials and communication services each gained more than 1 percent on the day. So overall, the stocks, the stock market went up on 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 Wednesday. So that's pretty good news. Just like Tuesday, so they had a back-to-back -back gain. Now, last Thursday, stocks were mixed, as energy, industrials, and real estate advanced, while materials and utilities sunk. The global Dow climbed 0.7 percent, Russia 2000 0.6 percent, the Dow and the Nasdaq up 0.3 percent and 2 percent, 0.2 percent respectively. The S&P 500 declined 0.1%, um, so it didn't quite go on a three-day winning streak. Treasury yields and the dollar declined while, cru while crude oil prices rose nearly 1%. So the day was a bit mixed, nothing really happening, no major news, anything like that, that really impacted the market. Now Friday, equities closed the week as they started posting impressive gains by the close of trading last Friday, the Russia 2000 advanced 2.3%. The global Dow went up 1.1%. The S&P 500 went up 0.9%. And then the Dow rose 0.8%. Lastly, the NASDAQ went up 0.7%. Treasury yield surged, reaching their highest level in nine months. Crude oil prices climbed 0.9%, but the dollar fell. Among the sectors, energy gained more than 5% offsetting a drop in consumer stocks. And by the way, I would like to give a shout out to those that attended the webinar that we did yesterday on how to build wealth, multi-generational wealth, especially using the means of life insurance as an investment tool or strategy that was hosted by my beautiful wife, Yvonne, and we did it at our church, and it was pretty good. We also did stream it live on Facebook to expand the audience as well as on Instagram and we had a pretty good turnout so definitely appreciate you guys for supporting on that if you do need a life insurance policy if you're looking to build wealth through multiple avenues you can feel free to reach out to Yvonne um, directly on Facebook or you can check out our um, Badu Life and Health Solutions LLC Facebook page or you can reach out to me as well and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have but let's continue Stocks climb higher for the week as investors seem to be gambling on fiscal stimulus in the near term and a virus vaccine within the next several months. So basically, investors are hoping for the stimulus package to be passed pretty soon. Um, they actually just released some news on it today. And then the COVID-19 vaccine, which has had some positive um, news, to say the least. The Dow closed well above the 30,000 mark, setting a new high in the process. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ also set new record highs last week. So basically, the stock market is at its absolute peak right now, and it can only, I mean, it can go down, but it really is going to go higher from here. The Russell 2000 and the global Dow each advanced more than 2% on the week, 
the Nasdaq is nearly 40%, my goodness, 40% higher than its 2019 year in closing value. And both the S&P 500 and the Russell 2000 are more than 13% ahead of the respective year end marks. I don't know if you guys understand what that means, but basically, even during the pandemic, the stock market has still found a way to be up big. And I'm not talking small, I'm talking big. I'm talking S&P s p 500 up almost 15 percent so far this year 14.5 percent to be exact and the nasdaq is up 39 percent this year i mean that is insane in a pandemic in a recession we're still doing good that lets you know how resilient you can be in life if you just stay persistent um if you just stay focused on the main goal at hand crude oil prices went up um, forty-five fifty-three per barrel to forty-six oh four. Price of Comax Gold went up seventeen eighty-one ninety to eighteen forty forty. So far this year, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is up five point eight nine percent. The Nasdaq is up thirty-eight point nine one percent. The S and P five hundred is up. 14.5%. And yes, somebody made a comment about Tesla. Shout out to Tesla for basically being a part of the S&P 500. Um, so that, that should see some steam there. But the S&P 500 nonetheless is up 14.50% so far this year, which is huge. It's above its typical average um, increase. Russell 2000, which used to be down, is holy cow, is now up 13.42%. That means that smaller businesses outside of the S&P 500 are also doing pretty good. Um, those, those companies are doing pretty well. It looks like we're really recovering from the pandemic. It looks like things are, are looking pretty okay, I should say. And that's probably why they didn't want to pass a stimulus bill that was of that size um, in the past. So not everyone is struggling, basically. That's what the data is telling you here. Global Dow is up 7.34%. So even the global stocks are doing pretty good. So even those are starting to recover. So overall, this is telling me that the economy is in recovery mode, that we'll be out of a recession pretty soon. Um, hopefully, COVID-19 will be a thing of the past as far as it being a pandemic. Of course, COVID will not go away as a disease itself, um, just like the flu and all other diseases like Ebola. These are all things that will probably be here pretty much forever. We just have to find ways to slow it down and basically find ways to prevent it from significantly impacting people. Federal funds rate is at 0%. So interest rates are at a dead 0%. They might increase it in the future, but I can imagine they probably won't as long as we're in this pandemic. Ten-year treasuries are at 0.96%. I mean, that is terrible, to say the least. I own a week ahead. The final estimate of gross domestic product, or GDP for short, for the third quarter is released this week. The second estimate projected that the economy expanded at a rate of 33.1%. So that's pretty good in the third quarter. A figure that's not expected to change much in the final estimate. So basically would mean that we're back in expansion mode um, as it re relates to the economy. Remember, Q1 and Q2 were terrible, to say the least. Also on this week is the latest report on the Consumer Price Index, or CPI for short, which is one of the indicators of inflation. Um, the CPI was unchanged in October and has increased by a mere 1.2% for the year as inflationary pressures remain muted. Basically, inflation has slowed down, probably as you guessed it. Um, people are spending less money. Basically, we're in this pandemic, so people can't spend as lavishly as they want to, basically. That's what, that's what that number is telling you. So remember, it's all a cycle. At the end of the day, it's all a cycle. People, um, basically, as people make more money, they spend, they spend the money. Right, so money comes in, money goes out. That's what boosts the economy. But then when people don't make money or they don't make as much money, they stop spending as much, so that reduces the economy. 
So in a way, if you think about it, money comes in, money goes back out. Where is the money at the end of the day? If you make more of it, you're spending it anyway. And if you're making less of it, you don't have anything to spend. So where is the money to begin with? Um, so that's the cycle that it, it's it's really it's also a mental thing, too. I mean, it's really impacting people. It's a cycle. If you get money, you spend it, you get money, you spend it, you get money, you spend it. And at the end of the day, what is it? To sh- what do you have to show for it? That's that's the question of the day. Now, how can you make more money? How can you increase your wealth? How can you improve what you have? Is you can build some credit and start using what's called leverage the power of multiplying your money using less of your money to make more money so this presentation is on how to build credit even during a pandemic such as COVID-19 the truth is most people don't understand what their credit score is truly made up made up of they just don't they don't really fully understand everything so my job today is to help you understand it and not only that help you improve your credit score by leveraging some some strategies and some tools that's out there for you. You need good credit to optimize cash flow, which means the basically if you want to borrow money, then you do need pretty decent credit. And I'll tell you what I mean when I say good credit or decent credit. As a matter of fact, I'll just tell you now. Typically, it's a 680 or above credit score is a decent credit score. I would say try to aim for 700. And if you're a a heavy shot or if you're a big shot, then try to go for a 720. The higher the credit, the better, to be honest. Now, if you have a perfect credit score, it means you're doing something wrong, actually. It's it's kind of sad, but it actually does mean you're doing something wrong if you have an 850 solid, solid, perfect credit score. Um, It means you're not leveraging enough. It means you're not you're not utilizing your credit to your maximum benefit. It doesn't matter if you're Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos. They all borrow money. Trust me. They all borrow money. That's how they become wealthy is they leverage money. They leverage other people's money because they know that they can do more with that money beyond what they can do with their own money. So they're basically using more money in total because now they have more money to work with. So whenever you deposit money into a bank, a bank could take that dollar. Let's say you put a dollar in the bank right now a bank can take that dollar and lend out $10 on your $1. And nowadays, they're able to borrow that money from the Federal Reserve at 0% interest. <laughs> and here's the scary part. They lend it back to you in the form of a credit card where you pay interest at about 30%. Do you, I mean, do, do you see the scheme that's going on? You put money into a bank. You get a credit card at that same bank. The bank uses your money, multiplies it by 10, they go to the Federal Reserve, say, hey, Federal Reserve, I have this, um, let's just say $1,000 that's been invested into my bank account. Now I need to, I need 10000 And the Federal Reserve says, hey, you're J.P. Morgan Chase, we trust you, we know, we know all about you. So here's 10000 we won't even charge you any interest for it, you know. Benchmark interest rates are 0% right now. And then all of a sudden, they go ahead and lend it back to you in the form of a credit card that you use, you max out, you go to your your Black Friday shopping and all that. They charge you interest, and then you might get a mortgage. Well, that same bank you're putting the money at, too, is you're paying mortgage, you're paying interest on a mortgage. Remember, nothing wrong with being owning a house. I just want you to understand the concept of the money scheme that's going on. Um... Yeah, big shout out to Millie. She said, thank you so much for, um, <clears throat> thank you so much, learning so much each each time listening in. Absolutely. Definitely appreciate that. So essentially, why do you need credit is because you can borrow money in order to do more with it. Basically, the ability to make more using less of your own. Real estate is a great example. Me personally, I love real estate. I'm invested heavily into real estate. So for me, I always have to have a pretty good credit score. If not, the banks won't loan me any money. They won't trust me. 
they'll think that I won't pay them back because my credit is the thing that that shows them my my worthiness as a borrower. And I always like to say this that it's kind of it's kind of crazy, but there is a, a Bible verse that the borrower is slave to the lender. And I would say that for me personally, it is a true statement. But at the same time, I would much rather be a wealthy slave than not have any money at all. Right. So I think you always have to interpret things the way that you you see it. Right. You always have to use um, some sort of common sense when it comes to certain things. So although you might hear something like that, and I always like to use certain Bible references in my teachings just to let you see where things are coming from. So although it is true, technically, I just want you to understand that there's nothing really wrong with that. It's you're making money, you're building wealth. At the end of the day, the loans will be paid at some point in, in, in time anyway and you're accelerating your wealth at a much faster pace as opposed to using your own money or having no money at all. Um, so keep in mind, some of the wealthiest people on this planet got there through, through, um, through credit and debt. As a matter of fact, one of my mentors, Robert Kiyosaki, who's a real estate investor, all he does is invest with debt. And now he's worth over $80 million just borrowing other people's money. It's crazy. Jeff Bezos, one of the wealthiest men on the planet, he also borrows money, right? So that that's just something to keep in mind. You might be wondering, why in the world do these wealthy people, why would a billionaire borrow money? Because they know how they know what to do with the money. When you hand them the money, they're going to turn around and make ten times that money. So to them, it means nothing. Borrowing, slave to a lender, that doesn't mean anything to them. They're just multiplying their wealth every single day. Um. So that that's just something to keep in mind. So you can make money by borrowing other people's money. That's just an, an example, like real estate. And then you can use the time value of money, which is basically taking out a loan instead of paying cash and investing that money in order to generate a return on investment. For example, you take out a loan that's at a 5% interest rate, but the S&P 500 yields about 10% on average well now you've just gotten ahead by twice two times meaning your 10% is greater than 5% so you're always going to get ahead in the race you take the cut you split the difference basically you keep you keep 10% you pay back the bank 5% and the net of it is you keep basically the difference between 10 minus 5 which is 5% so that's how you multiply wealth fast i mean and in the context of real estate, you can multiply it very fast because you can borrow nowadays up to 100% of the bank's money with none of your own money tied into it. You can collect your rent. You can do all of that. And it can it can really, really help you. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. I, I always like to get deep into the context of the presentation before we even get into the components of a person's credit score. And keep in mind, you can have multiple credit scores. You can have up to, I mean, over 10 credit scores at, at the same time because there's different credit bureaus that use different um, rating or scoring systems in order to generate a score. So your credit score actually doesn't mean anything. It's really the report. The content in the credit report determines the, um, the credit score itself. There are three major credit reporting agencies, which are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Those are the folks that make money off basically information that you provide um, to them. They sell it to the banks. They sell it to financial institutions so that the banks can get information to see whether or not you're a credit-worthy individual. Now, there are six components to a person's credit score. The first one is credit card utilization, which has a high impact factor. It's probably the, so it's actually the second highest, slightly the second highest, about makes up about 30% of your credit score. And credit card utilization is basically the, you take the balances of your credit card, so how much you've used on the credit cards, and you divide it by the 
the limit. So let's say you got a Capital One credit card and it has a thousand dollar limit and you spend a hundred dollars on it or you left a balance of a hundred dollars. Well, your utilization rate is now 10%, which is 100 divided by 1,000. So basically, you take your credit card balance or balances and divide it by your credit limit or limits. You basically compile all of them together, and that gets your utilization rate. Very, very simple formula. Some banks report balances on different days other than the statement dates. So for example, with Chase, this is from experience, if you pay off a Chase business, uh, I'm sorry, a Chase credit card, then basically you, um, they, they report it the next day. So the moment you pay off a Chase credit card, they report to the bureaus the next day. You don't have to wait until the statement date. So for those that are looking to apply for a mortgage or something like that, that could be a strategy. Maybe you like to really benefit from like rewards points and all that stuff, or you, you're just a strategist by nature but you don't want it to hurt your ability to get a mortgage, then you can pay off the credit card when you're able to and then apply for the mortgage once everything has been refreshed. So you could do that. And credit scores are, they can be good for, I've heard about 90 days or so. So as soon as long as they have that credit report and it, it's there, it's good for 90 days. All right, so just, just something to keep in mind there. And then you should not leave a balance on a card. Or if anything, leave a small balance, maybe $20 or so. I would say don't necessarily leave a large balance. Um, leave a pretty small balance so that you, you do use the card and you use it to some benefit. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, like the what I, what I typically say with a credit card, maybe use it once in the month like use it once or you can like especially when you start now just use it one time swipe it one time and pay it off as soon as possible so just keep that in mind so just, just use it one time and I mean one time don't treat this credit card as your debit card where you just swipe and left and right um, like tinder like you, you, s you use it one time and you basically Pay it off as soon as you can. That way you don't have a balance left on the card and they report they report that. They say, okay, this person has made an on-time payment. They have no balance. Utilization rate is low. So it, it starts building that credit. It starts getting you in, in, in the game, basically. It is best to also avoid paying interest. If you leave a balance on the card, that's not a 0% interest rate credit card. You do start paying interest. So the thing with credit cards, do not pay interest on them. It can be as high as 30%. I don't know a single person on this planet right now that can consistently make 30% every single year, including Warren Buffett. So just keep that in mind. You don't necessarily want to keep a balance because if the greatest investor of all time can't make 30% a year consistently each and every year, then I don't think you can either. Um, so just keep that in mind. So try to stay below 30% utilization. So if your limit is 1000 try to stay below $300 as the balance that you leave. Because once you creep up above 30%, it starts putting you into quote-unquote danger territory. So try to stay below 30%. It makes your credit score real nice and clean. Some cards offer 0% APR or interest rate, which are typically the best cards. So I know Chase... For example, to Chase Freedom, they give you 0% for about 12 months or so. The lower the ratio, the higher your credit score. So try to keep it as low as possible, ideally 0%. Payment history is the next one, and this is the highest impact factor on your credit report. So this is basically how many on-time payments you've made. On-time means you've paid them within 30 days of the due date, and I'm not saying be late on any payments. What I am saying is, Pay your bills on time, especially your debt payments. If anything, put everything on auto pay. Everything. Me personally, all my bills are on auto pay. Every single one is on auto pay. Because you don't want to forget. And on top of that, not only do I have my bills on auto pay, 
I have an app called Bills on my phone. Literally, it's called Bills, and it tracks the dates. It tracks everything, the date, the amount, the um, whether I've paid it or not sort of deal. All the bills that I have each month. I, I got a lot of bills, right? A lot of bills that I pay every month, and every single one is on autopilot, basically. Um, so try to, try to keep try to pay your bills on time. Shoot for a hundred percent payment history. You should never miss a payment. Even one can hurt your credit score. It basically proves that you're not as credit worthy as somebody who has a hundred percent on time payments. So set up automatic payments and please make sure you monitor them. Sometimes when you set it up the first time, it doesn't go through because it needs a full cycle to be able to do it. So monitor things like that. Maybe you need to pay it manually the first month, and then every month after that, it's on autopilot. And any card you have linked to the auto pay or any account you have linked to the auto pay, make sure it has it has sufficient funds in there. You don't want NSF fees and all that stuff. You just don't want that. Just keep keep money coming in, and make sure those bills are paid. Of course, pay yourself first. Meaning, when you receive money, save a portion first or invest a portion first before you go ahead and pay those bills. So make sure you have something allocated towards your savings, perhaps an Acorns account that automatically pulls money from your checking account. It's a very, very, very powerful tool to use. Um, so the higher your payment history, the higher your credit score. So try to keep your payment history at 100%. It is big. 35% of your credit score is made up of payment history. Next is the derogatory marks. This is also another high impact factor. You want to stay away from these. And these are collections, bankruptcies, judgments, liens, outstanding tax bills, although now taxes can technically not no longer go on your credit. And I am not saying avoid the IRS. Um, they made a movie recently about Al Capone and basically talking about how he ended up the only way they caught Al Capone was not because of the drugs or the killings or anything like that. It was because of tax evasion. Um, the IRS, Uncle Sam, the tax man, was the one that got him. It was nobody else but the tax man. They had nothing on him except for taxes. So if Uncle Sam can get Al Capone, Al Uncle Sam can get you too. Um, foreclosures. You know, you, you want to stay away from these at all costs. Trust me. So absolutely want to avoid these, including your taxes. Pay your tax bills on time. I can help you settle tax debts. That is one service that we do offer known as tax representation. So shameless plug, we do offer tax representation as a service to help you settle your tax debts with the IRS and also the state authorities. If you do end up getting a derogatory mark, such as an unpaid medical bill, it does stay on your credit report for about seven years unless you go through a manual removal process, which is through credit repair, which is also another service that we offer, shameless plug. The less derogatory marks on your report, the higher your credit score. So stay away from these at all costs. If, somebody's, if you receive a letter in the mail and it has collections at the top of it, immediately act. Here's one thing you can do as a bonus during COVID-19. Anybody you're in collections with, call them up tomorrow in the morning. Matter of fact, call them right after this presentation. Tell them that you've had a, a, a financial disaster, COVID-19, right, and that you can only settle for a 10% of the balance. So if you owe 10000 tell them you only have 1000 They'll take it. Nine times out of ten, they'll take it. Why? Because they know that you took initiative to reach out to them to offer them to pay them ten thousand. Right? For me personally, I'm owed a lot of money. A lot of people owe me money. So for me, it's like, okay, if somebody's reaching out to me and saying they they can pay me, I'm happy about that because some of these folks I know they won't pay me. Right? Unless I take extreme measures to collect the money, they won't necessarily pay me. So for me, if I'm a collector, if I'm a debt collector, and you call me and I never thought you would call me or, or pay me, I'm real happy if you offer me even 10% of the balance due. So think about it just from always put yourself on the other side and say, okay, well, this person owes me 10. They haven't called me. They haven't emailed me. I mean, it's been about a year. We're thinking about writing it off completely. 
there's not really a whole lot they can do to you. They can't file liens and judgments and stuff like that. But honestly, nowadays, I mean, I've, I've tried that on literally. I've, I've worked with collections companies to go aggressively pursue money that, that was owed to me. And th these were mainly um, derived from my car rental company. And ultimately, in most cases, to no avail. So if you're telling me that you're going to pay me $1,000, I'll take that. You can, you probably can go for maybe five hundred, but honestly, I would say just just be generous. Like just um, do good for for people. But especially with COVID nineteen, you can call co debt collectors right now and settle for way lower than what you owe them. And this includes student loans. This includes medical bills. Um, th this includes pretty much any debt that's out there right now. So if you owe somebody, call them up right now or after this presentation and ask them for a reduction of the balance due. If you don't, it will stay in collections. It will end up on your credit score for seven years. So you got to wait seven years, and that's seven years after you've paid it off, by the way. And then the next thing is, um, so yeah, basically the less the derogatory marks, the higher your credit score. Next is age of credit history. This has a medium impact factor. Basically, banks like to see a mix of loans. So basically, with this one, the more loans you have, the better the credit history. Keep your accounts open for as long as you as possible. Right? Never, never, um, never cancel a credit card. Don't ever do that. But basically, just just build good good history with that card, and keep the accounts open, even if it's at a zero dollar balance. Occasionally, use it maybe once every three months or so. Use sound judgment when deciding which loans to keep. So loans that are high interest rates, we tend to want to pay them off earlier. Loans that are at a low interest rate, we don't want to touch them at all, really. I mean, we still want to make our monthly payments, but we don't want to pay it off because we know we can make more from that money. Don't pay off interest-free loans. So this is the same point. Or student loans due to the benefits of building your credit, especially if you're young, you're new to the credit game. Student loans can help you build your credit because it is, in fact, a loan. And most of these loans, to my knowledge, have pretty low interest rates, at least compared to what where they could be. Pay off loans that carry the highest interest rates first, such as outstanding credit cards. Those credit cards, you want to pay them off ASAP. ASAP. The loans, the loans you should keep from best to worst are interest-free loans, student loans, a mortgage, a car loan, a personal loan, and then credit card. That's the last one on the list. Any interest rate above 6% to me is a bit high, and you should consider paying off that loan. Next on the list is credit inquiry. So credit inquiries has a low impact factor on your credit score. Basically, anytime you apply for new credit, you're seeking new credit actively, then it leads to a hard inquiry. The more inquiries you have, the lower your credit score. So try to avoid applying for too many, too much credit at a time, especially in different categories. Like don't be applying for a mortgage and then a credit card and then a car loan. I mean, that's a nightmare. Lenders hate seeing that. So it's okay. Maybe you're applying for a mortgage and you want to seek two options. That's okay. But what I'm saying is don't apply for that mortgage while applying for a credit card, while applying for a car loan, then a business loan. You don't want to do that. It just makes it look a bit suspicious as to why you're applying for all this debt at the same time. Are you going to bail on them, go to Vegas, wherever it is? Um, but basically, don't apply for too much credit at the same time. Now, if you do receive a pre-approved loan, something in the mail that has the words pre-approval on it and automatic credit limit increases, those do not lead to hard inquiries. They lead to what's called soft inquiries, which means it does not impact your credit score. Last but not least on the list is total accounts. So total accounts has a low impact factor. It's similar to age of credit history, but it does take into account both open and closed accounts. So age of credit history only takes into account open accounts. Total accounts take into account both open and closed accounts, essentially. It just shows your history with those accounts. The more total accounts you have, the higher your credit score. So there you have it. Those are the six factors that impact your credit score. The first one is credit card utilization, which has a high impact. 
The second is payment history, which also has a high impact. Next is derogatory remarks, and that has a high impact. Then it's age of credit history that has a medium impact. Then credit inquiries that has a low impact. And then total accounts, which also has a low impact. To conclude, credit scores do range from 300 to 850, at least most. Um, that, that's like your typical. A good credit score, according to multiple sources, is a 720. But 700 is not bad at all. I mean, if you got a 700 credit score, you, you're pretty good. You know, if you um if you're a guy and you're looking to date a woman and she asks you what are some of your strengths or basically you want to demonstrate some strengths, one of them could be your credit score. And the opposite applies as well. The higher your score, the better chances of getting approved for loans and also the lower your interest rate potentially. There are free credit score apps such as Credit Karma, which are pretty good. Also Experian does have a site or an app that shows you your score for free. Um, you can obtain your credit from reporting agencies at least once a year. And then any lender that causes a hard inquiry owes you a credit score check. Basically, they owe you a credit report. FICO score is the most accurate, so there's different scoring models, and FICO tends to be the most accurate. Please watch out for fees, like credit card fees, those annual fees. Watch out for those. The best terms of a card are no annual fee, 0% APR for at least 12 months, high credit limit, and rewards points, a.k.a. cash back. So anytime you spend money on a card, they can get you cash back. For example, the Chase Freedom can give you $500 cash back if you spend to $3,000 in the first um, in the first three months or so. And then they have 5% bonus categories, for example, Walmart. So anytime you shop at those places, you get 5% cash back. That's a 5% interest rate on your m on money that you were going to spend anyway. So you do have to use it to your benefit when you're starting out. Forget about the whole cash back and all that stuff. Um, you should be interested more in building the credit, getting, getting your feet wet. The moment you start using a card like crazy, you can get yourself into some deep, deep, deep trouble. I have clients that have been there, and I've had to get them out the hole. Um, so with that being said, that was the business. I'm sorry, that was the credit score segment on how to build your credit score during a pandemic such as COVID-19. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. And with that being said, my name is Chef Badu, and I look forward to continuously delivering you all some content. Thank you.